Okay, so we worked on a uh, little round two um, from based, you know, really building off last week's. We're not going to repeat anything that we did last week. Uh, no. Last last week, the focus was mainly on. Hold on. Last week, the focus. Last week, the focus was mainly on preparation for Pesach. Uh, now we want to focus on Lil Haseder. Um, really, two aspects of Lel Haseder. One is the some halachot surrounding Lel Haseder, and then we want to go to understanding uh, some of the derashot and the Haggadah um, that Hazal presented in front of us, and really um, probably try to encapsulate uh, some type of something meaningful. Um, it could be for a lot of us the first time that we're going through uh, the Seder alone, and we want to know how to make this Seder the most meaningful experience. Uh, you know, for us taking it alone the first time. So I want to open up with a couple of questions, Rabbi. Well, welcome back. Um, really opening up with a couple of things leading up to Pesach that maybe we didn't cover. Uh, a couple of halachot, um, some of which we discussed, some also questions I got recently. Uh, if we could just discuss hametz for a second. Um, it came up... Uh, from you, from other rabbis as well, allowing the selling of hametz mamash, you know, before Pesach this year, um, instead of, you know, have everyone having to run to the stores, trying to find bread, whatnot afterwards, uh, allowing the selling of actual uh, hametz this year. Uh, a question that came up was, um, we wanted to know if it's okay to order food from now ordering hametz from now for delivery on April 20th, right after the holiday, something like that. Um, and also a lot of us um, participate in like an Amazon subscribe and save, where it's like a monthly um, delivery to you, to your house. Uh, and a lot of times it consists of hametz. So I'm assuming we have to, you know, stop the delivery of hametz, you know, during the holiday. Uh, but for it to deliver, if it's, even if it's en route to a house and then deliver the day after the holiday, um, or we'll could even deliver on our doorstep the last day of the holiday, what is the, the laws pertain, you know, surrounding these uh, halachot? So, so the answer is yes. You can order something now for delivery after the holiday. The reason is because from what I looked into, what I checked in, ownership is not really 100% yours until you take possession. And so therefore, you can order something now to be delivered after the holiday. However, there's one caveat. Um, as you mentioned, if, it's del if, it, if it is delivered, um, whatever it might be, whatever hametz might be delivered, if it is delivered before the time and it's put on your doorstep. So there are those that says, oh, if it's delivered, then it becomes mine because, so that we don't have to worry about. But you cannot take it into your house. and assuming if it's a rainy day, you can't even put it in a place where it won't get wet. Because that would mean that you want it, that you're desiring the kiyum of that hametz on Pesach. So again, you're allowed to get the, you're allowed to order something after Pesach. If it is delivered for you on the last day, right? Or during Pesach, even if it's put on your porch, that's fine. You may not bring it into your home because then you're physically taking possession of it in your premises. And your premises now is what we call a kinyan. It takes ownership. And while it's outside, if that happens to be a rainy day, you cannot move it, protect it, do anything to uh, protect it. Um, though that's are the conditions. But to order it, and even if it becomes delivered on Pesach, as long as you don't, Take it. He just leaves it there. That's fine. Okay. And what about ordering it to deliver on the last day of Pesach? No. If you if you if you specifically ask for delivery of hametz on Pesach, even the last day, that's not permitted. Okay. Um, for a lot of us, uh, it's probably going to be cooking for the first time on holidays. Many of us without housekeepers. Um, a lot of us are nervous, you know, a three-day holiday uh, when it comes to cooking, leaving a fire on for three days, 
how would we go about you know cooking on the first day of the holiday stove tops um, or even baking uh, potentially having to leave things on for 72 hours okay so it depends this question can be answered in one of two ways one if we're one assuming that there is a which makes it very easy that there's a non-jewish person in the house if there's a non-jewish person in the house then it would be totally permitted if you're cooking to ask the non-jew to turn off the fire totally right um that would be permitted on the second day you would then uh, either ask her to turn it on or you would turn it on with transference of fire however assuming that there's no non-jew available to shut the fire and kibui turning off the fire on yom tov is a problem and if a person is nervous about leaving a stovetop for example on for three days the only it's uh, the only way we can somewhat get up it's not going to fully solve the problem is you while the food is on the fire while the food is now cooking on the fire you can lower the fire because that helps in the cooking process let's assume you want the food to cook slower so you lower the fire to a simmer and th therefore your, your food is now being cooked slowly the way you want it and therefore you could lower it close to a simmer and then when you're done you could leave you you would leave it like that at the simmer but you cannot shut the fire yourself that that would be a problem okay um i'm going to jump back to one more hamid's question that uh ham yosef dan i sent over ah. i'm sure someone sent him the question because he of course he can answer these questions himself as well a uh, question came in as for a housekeeper owning hametz in the basement, in your basement. How do we go about that? Is that allowed? Can she keep her hametz in your um, in your domain? Right, so this is a it's a gemara mifurashe. It's a Rambam mifurash. Shilcha i ataroe, but la toroe shil aherim. You cannot actually um, have possession of your hametz, and therefore you can't even liyare. Okay, it shouldn't be found, shouldn't be seen in your possession. However, if it belongs to somebody else, they can have it. And therefore, it is totally permitted for them to have habits, even if it's in your home. Some certain things need to be clarified, however. Um, if she is now going to discard it, or if she ate, let's say, half of the sandwich, and then she decides she's not hungry anymore, and she decides to put the sandwich in your freezer, and she doesn't want it, and therefore that could be a problem. So she can have her own hametz. However, she should discard, preferably in a garbage can outside, whatever, she, when she's finished with it, whatever she's eating, that it should not be considered whatever, when she's mafkira, when she's finished with it, it shouldn't be your, considered something that you take possession of. But as long as she wants it, it's her meal and she's eating it, it's certainly not a problem of any goy, and it's not yours. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to jump back to the first question. There's a couple of follow-ups that I'm getting texts in as you're uh, as you're talking. But following up the housekeeper question, uh, housekeeper, the question of deliveries on that come on the last day of Pesach. Um, someone wanted to know if a housekeeper brings it into the house. If she does it on her own, we didn't tell her to do so. How do we handle that situation? Is that okay? If the housekeeper takes possession of it on her own and it becomes, and it's clear her, her, her indication is that she's taking her possession, then it's permissible. If she's taking it, you tell her it's yours, and if she wants to take her own possession, that's fine. If, however, she's simply just putting it in your house on your behalf and taking possession, then, it's, then that could be a problem. Which is probably the case. You'd have to instruct her to, you'd have to instruct her how to do it, right? In other words, but again, it's very important. If you didn't know about it, let's say you didn't know about it and she accidentally brought it into your house, right? Mm -hmm. That's not a problem, right? She brought it in, you didn't even know about it. And you, if she would have asked, she would have told her to leave it out. And she went and brought it in, you know, without your knowledge, then it's okay. I was assuming that you were trying to find a way to get it inside and you were going to tell her to do it and to her claim it on, on her behalf or your behalf. That's how I was answering the question. 
However, let's imagine this scenario. It was outside. It was raining. You left it in. She, she brought it into the basement or she brought it in. We have a rule. And this is, a person's premises are acquire something for him, but not against his will. It's not it's not against his will. That's why your premises is even your patio, your porch is no different than your house. Why didn't that not acquire? Because your, your premises won't acquire the item against your will. And so therefore, if they deliver it, no problem. If the housekeeper then sees it, oh, it's getting rain. She puts it in the house. You, you have, you went, to, you were in the back. You didn't even know, and all of a sudden, it's in your house. As long as you don't touch it, or you don't move it, or you don't like show any level of ownership. Again, it's like it was in your in your uh, outside porch. However, to tell her to bring it in, that would be forbidden. Mm -hmm. Okay, that clarified. Thank you. Uh, now moving on to Lel Hased itself. Um, so I guess a couple of halachot surrounding Lel HaSeder. Uh, firstly, what is the earliest time we can begin? I mean, we're all at home, at home this year. We're not coming home from the Bet HaKnesset. So what is the time we should be, you know, praying and starting Lel HaSeder and any, you know, times that we need to take, to take into consideration as we go through? So um, as far as I understand, sunset, we're operating on sunset. So sunset, I think, is about 7.31 on Wednesday nights, yeah. I think that's the time for sunset. Preferably, ideally, one begins, Leila said that because we're dealing with mitzvot, mitzvot the oraita, of eating the matzah, the magid, the haggadah, and also mitzvot the rabbanan, of having the four cups. So ideally, one should start the Leila said that after Benesh Mashot, when it's Vadai Laila. So one should, that would mean that one should begin at approximately uh, where we usually do 40 minutes after sunset, like about 8, 11. Um, if that's difficult, and there are young, young, um, I'm told, oh, what? I made a mistake on sunset? Okay. My, if, I'll just, if sunset is two or three minutes earlier, then please adjust. Um, if it becomes difficult, to begin um, the Lila Seder that late, one has, I would say, about a 12 minute, you could do it earlier than that, and you could begin your Lila Seder about eight o'clock. Okay. Um, are there any halachot that we should be aware of during, you know, throughout Lila Seder? When I dress, I mean, you went through most of the Shi'urim already, is there anything that comes to mind other halachot regarding Lila Seder? So, uh, one halacha, which is interesting, which I'll mention, which it's mostly Perush Haggadah and halacha together. I was once asked, I said, Rabbi, they said, Rabbi, can we say this year the halach ma'anya? Because we're not inviting anybody in, and I guess what, if anyone knocked on our door, appropriately so, we would say, please, you cannot come into my house for the seder. So what is it? Anyone who's hungry, come and eat. Is that permitted? So my answer was yes. He says, why? Because in reality, uh, just and this will give me an opportunity to explain a little bit about the halach ma'anya. In reality, the halach ma'anya is really not, inv not about an invitation to a guest. Because again, who invites somebody once you're done with Kiddush? And that's when I decide I'm going to invite a person to the house. Rather, and I'm going to hear, quote, an interesting perush of perush Haggadah by Yiskor Yosef, Rabbi Yosef Mesas, who um, wrote a very interesting perush on that guy. And then he commented, he says this. He, he says, if you look at the Halach Ma'anya, Halach Ma'anya, which is, again, in Aramaic, everyone understands it, the language that was spoken, is a later addition to the Lila Seder. It's not mentioned in the Mishnah. And what is it about? The Halach Ma'anya is actually the Lila Seder in Galut. We say Halach Ma'anya di'achalu ab'hatana ba'ra'ad al-Misra'im. What is it? They ate 
they ate matzah in Mitzrayim. This is the bread of affliction that we ate in Egypt. The first question is, did they eat bread of affliction in Egypt? Right? So the, the, the answer is, according to many commentators, yes, they did. Matzah, in addition to being the bread of, of the uh, redemption that they ate because they left so quickly, it was also a bread of affliction. And that's what we call it, Lehem Oni, that they ate in Egypt because they didn't have they didn't have the time for their bread to rise because of hunger. So, by the way, this makes the message of delivery so much more potent because the very badge, the very proud symbol of poverty, which was the Masah, HaKadosh Baruch Hu Yishtabach turned it into the symbol of deliverance. And so we say, This is the bread of way in Egypt. Called the and we say the reason why we have guests now is because the only reason why a person would come and eat, um, be part of the guests in this Lela Sede, is because they're still they're hungry. But in the time of the Bet Hamikdash, why would somebody come to my house for Lel Had Sede? Not because he's hungry, because he needs to partake of Korban Pesach, and he had. And they used to get together in groups because the Korban Pesach was, was, a, um, was eaten in large groups. And so therefore, people used to get together. So we say, Kol Dekhfin. This year, we invite people because they're hungry. Kol Ditzrich. But we, we think about a future time where we invite people because of why? Because they need to partake of Korban Pesach in a better time, a better generation. And so that's why we end. This year we're, we're, we're still enslaved. We're still in Galut. But we think of a better time. The Shana Baba the Israel. Next, next year will be in Eretz Israel in Yerushalayim. So I find no more potent aspect of the Seder to be saved than during this time. This year, we're in difficult times. We can't even invite guests for any reason. But we think about next year and next to the Seder we will be inviting for the ultimate redemption. So I think it's a very appropriate um, uh, prayer for the Lasseded. So um, yes, we should say it. And I think even with extra Kavanah this year. Okay. Um, now moving on to the as as we go through, and you opened up with Halach um, Ma'anya, what about, ask, I guess maybe a little more reasoning with some of the things that we do. So something is like yahats. Um, we're breaking the matzah just to eat it later. Um, what's the, what is the significance of that? So again, many people think we just break the yahats so we can at that point hide the fikoman. Um, although that is part of what we do. We break the yahats um, because we have to make hamotzi and alachilat matzah. And so anytime, on any holiday, on any Shabbat, we have to have lechem mishneh, two breads. So we have to have two matzot. But we have a third matzah, which is lechem oni, a broken matzah. Now, we want to have two full ones. That's why we need three. You have to have two full ones. But we want a broken one to represent the lechem oni, to represent that. So that's why we have two and the broken one. And that's why... We make hamotzi lehmina aretz on the full and alachilat matzah on the full one and the broken one. And that's why we break it at that point. I mean, uh, it's really for the hamotzi. Um, in terms of why do we have to break it before the magi, uh, that's already more customary. Mm -hmm. I, I want to make one note. Um, you know, we're all very familiar with this poem, Kadesh or Hatz, Karpas or Hatz. And um, that poem, which every Jew around the entire globe uses. And it's, a, it's an interesting zikhut that we have. One the Ashkenazim, Sfaradim, Temanim, everybody using this one poem to symbolize Lel HaSedeh. But that is, a, it comes, we, we don't do it because it's in the poem. The poem came to summarize what we do. And in, in, the, in the Haggadah and in the Kadeh, not everything is of the same severity. For example, the Kiddush, right? Kiddush is the oraita, right? Kiddush is like banana, the four cups of the banana. The kapas is, is a 
if you didn't have karpas, did do karpas, yatsata yidei chavat lelaseder. Um, if you don't break it at that point, that's our custom. We break it at that point. But uh, you know, if you if you broke it later, you were yotze. The magid is the oraita. Um, so it, it's important to to have that understanding of the different aspects of of what we do on lelaseder. Um, the oraita, the rabbanan. I think that's important. Then, um, as you know, we put out. Um, we had to put out an, an abridged form of the Haggadah. Um, I think it went out on Friday, and there'll be some printed ones that are coming out tomorrow. So in that Haggadah, which is, again, to be used for some of the people that are making a seder for the firm that cannot complete the seder, some of our community's elderly, and then those who aren't well, Shem will give them Rufu Ashlema. Um, it's important to, to understand, even in that, we put a... This, a distinction between what is the oraita, what is the rabbanan, and what is customarily, because different aspects of the seder have a different um, level of severity, and that's important to understand. Okay, um, I guess on that note, um, where'd it go? Speaking customary versus the rabbanan, how would you categorize korech? Um, I guess, why do we care to fulfill the halakha like Hillel? Um, why is it enough to eat them separately, uh, especially since that's basically the, 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 the pshat, I would say the pshat of the pesukim and, and probably the pshat of the halakha. Why do we need to add on Hillel? Is that something customary? Is that the Rabbanan? How do we treat that? Okay. It, it's, a, it's, a, it's a funny practice that we do, so I'll, I'll give you a little background. In the, in, in the times of the Beit HaMikdash, we had this debate between the Hachamim and Hillel. Hachamim weren't strict than Hillel. Hachamim said, you can eat the Matzah separately, you can eat the Matzah separately, and in those days you eat the Korban Pesach separately. Hillel mandated that they had to be eaten together. Right? Matzah, Maror, Korban Pesach together. If you ate it, like Hillel together, if that's all you did, you fulfilled your obligation according to the Hachamim and according to Hillel. So I'll flip your question for a minute. Why don't we just do Korech? Fulfill everybody and finish. Right? So the answer given by the post is because Matzah is the Oraita and Maror is the Rabbanan. And we, in the times of Hillel, of course you could eat it together because they were all the Oraita. So no problem. But even Hillel would agree, today, we have to have the matzah separately because matzah is the only mitzvah deoraita that we're eating. So we eat the matzah. And then maror, which is the rabbanan, we eat it, of course, separately. We can't now use the sandwich because matzah, there's no obligation anymore. Maror, we still have the rabbanan. So we have to separate the obligations. So then, after we're done with that, we do customarily, just to remember the opinion of Hillel, we eat them in a sandwich. And that becomes, like I said, Korech becomes accustomed to remember how he used to do it. However, before you eat in the Korech, you fulfilled your obligation of Matzah and you fulfilled your obligation of Maror. So that's why we mentioned the Shi'urim that we mentioned by Matzah, 20 grams, two thirds of an ounce, which is about a third of a handmade round Matzah. And the maror, again, uh, approximately, depending on the um, what you're using, but if it's a romaine lettuce, approximately 27 grams of that. Um, th that Those shurim are stricter when you're eating it the first time. When it comes to the sandwich, it is appropriate to keep those shurim for anyone who can, but for somebody who is difficult, they can be more lenient on the shurim and the kore. Mm -hmm. So are you categorizing Korech as a custom, as a minhag? Yes. yes. Yeah. Okay. We spent a lot of time on Magid, really discussing a big portion of, you know, Lel you know, Yitziat Mitzrayim and, and all the, you know, stories surrounding Lel HaSeder. Um, wouldn't it be... I mean, easier, better, how much of it can we do over a meal? Um, and I may be 
shorten that part and speak more during the meal? Why do we have to spend so much time before we get to the meal um, speaking about Yitzhak Mitzrayim? Okay, so first of all, let, let, me, uh, let me clarify. The mitzvah applies all night, of even during the meal of Sipur Yitzhak Mitzrayim. Remember, there are two unique mitzvot de oraita the night. Almost everything that we do that night, added by Pesach, is a mitzvah de Rabbanan. Arba Kosot, Maror, those are mitzvot de Rabbanan. But there are two unique mitzvot that apply even in Galut to the Pesach, which is eating the matzah, which we discussed, and Sipur Yitziat Misraim, the Magid, to discuss Vigadta de Bincha. That's a mitzvah de Oraita. So um, it's important that we fulfill the obligation um, this year, as in every year, by motivating our children, a father speaking to his children. This will be a unique experience because on the one hand, it is a time where we're going to have small study. And the grandfather of the house, the one who usually for many, many years has led the large studying, that person may be eating the seder by himself. And we're going to break down our studying into very smaller units. Now, I know people who do that all the time because they feel that's a unique opportunity. So whether we like it or not, we always should look at a silver lining. And we have to say that this is a time where a father and his young children or his little older children could really spend some time connecting on a personal way in a way they never were able to do before. Right? I mean, always look at the positive, right? You can now unique make this Lela said that a unique experience by engaging on each child on his level without having to worry about the 30 people around you and the noise around you, whether this is going to disturb everyone. Right now you can have these smaller study. So I wanted to say that, that it's important to take this as an opportunity for families to connect on that more intimate level. Now, why does the Magid have to do, have to be placed in the beginning? Really, we like to be, focus on the Magid and being that it's a mitzvah de oraita, we spend the time prior to the meal focusing on the derashot of Hazal and the structured readings because those are specific readings that need to be um, spoken out and discussed. And many of them are brought down in the Mishnah and in Hazal. However, we have, you know, we say it on the, on the Lila Seder, right? Uh, that there was the Maseh of those four hachamim who were the whole night they were talking about you see, I had to tell the students come and said you have to stop now do we imagine that they didn't eat that they were doing all that in the Magid and they didn't have the Matzah and they didn't and they didn't they didn't eat, do any of them of course not that was probably after they've completed all the normal mitzvot they continued speaking about Sipur Yitzhak Mitzrayim throughout the night and um, that is appropriate to do and uh, you know sometimes you need maybe you need to save some of the Divrei Torah for the meal and that's fine you definitely you'll say the Hova when, when you discuss it during the meal the only catch is sometimes it's a little bit also hard to get everyone's attention while during the meal so you have to balance that and see how you can uh, how you can create that balance. Okay, and I see touched on a few points that I wanted to follow up on. Um, I guess I'll start firstly with the Drashot Hachamim Hazal, the Midrash that, that, we, that we really study on Lil Haseder is Arami Oved Avi, right? It's really, I, I don't know, I would say almost random Pesukim from Sefer Devarim, and we don't touch upon the actual narrative of Yitziat Mitzrayim from Sefer Shemot. What are, what are we doing? Why do Hazal set up the entire Haggadah based off that structure? So I think what Hazal are doing this night is um, we are engaging in a very subtle yet very profound interpretation of Psuki. Without us realizing it, we are actually delving into Midrash. But we're doing it in a unique way. 
we're actually having the psukim of the Torah explain themselves. We take a few psukim, Perashat Kitavo, which the person who was living in Yushalayim would say when he brings the Bikurim. That person who's bringing the Bikurim to the Bet HaMikdash has experienced the ultimate redemption. He is living the real good life, right? He is sitting in Yerushalayim on the Regalim, bringing the, the Bikurim and enjoying really the promise of God's bounty, bountiful pro, uh, promise. However, he at that point, we're told, he remembers his beginnings. He remembers at that very moment what HaKadosh Baruch Hu has done for him. He remembers where, he, where this all started and what God actually gave to him. He remembers his beginnings as Mitahilah of Davuda Zara, as Abadim Hayinu, which is, of course, the ultimate beginning place where Hachamim mandate you to start to say that. And you go through, he, he starts talking about how, where he was and where he has come from, Arami Oved Avi, and where he is now. And what we do is we read those psukim. And then as we read a few words in each pasuk, we compare it to the actual narrative that actually happened in Egypt. And we actually look and we engage in a cross study, a, a really a comparative study between Kitavo and Shemot. And while sometimes it escapes us, it's a very profound aspect of our existence and Equally as important, it's a very profound aspect of how Hachamim interpret and read Psukim. So those are two different important aspects of what we're doing and what we're engaging. Sometimes it escapes us and we don't even realize it. Okay, that's fine. But when we take some time to realize it, we'll understand how profound this Haggadah and this night really can be. Okay, interesting. Could you, I guess, could you... Um bring it all together with an example of what Hazal would do as taking one of the psukim and tying it back with a midrash, um, reinterpreting something from earlier in Shemot? Yeah, so, I mean, there are so many of them, but we can, uh, I, I can, we can, I can throw one out. In other words, which says like this, um, right? It says, Vayare otanu hamsrim anunu. So how is that translated? But that's, that's what he says. What does that mean? Any guesses? Anyone want to offer an interpretation? Just a translation. You're all on mute. <laughs> Anyone can speak. Uh, nobody can. Now I'm hearing a lot. Bad idea. <laughs> I got to unmute you, Rabbi. Hold on a second. Wait, 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 wait. I got to unmute you. All right, that was a bad idea. It was? Okay. <laughs> no, you can, you can, can someone, can you unmute one person who can raise yeah, their yeah. hand? Yeah, yeah, if so, someone wants to raise their hand, they can raise their hand to participate. You get participation points. Okay. No takers. Vayarea Wotanu sometimes is translated as they have done evil to us. Vayarea Wotanu Amasrim, Vayanunu. However, what a Hazal do? Hazal tell us in the Haggadah, they give us an interpretation of what Bayadeh Otanu Muslim means. And it doesn't mean they've done evil to us because what is the pasuk that the Baal Haggadah chooses as an example of Bayadeh Otanu Muslim? Bayadeh Otanu Muslim Kemoshi Ne'imad. And what's that pasuk? Hava Nitakema Lo Penyirbe. How is that a pasuk of how they did betas? That's they were planning to do betas. So rather, if you focus on what Hazal are telling you, they're not telling you that that pasuk means they did evil to us. They're telling us that Paro did something, and it's a very profound insight. What did Paro do? He made us look evil. They made us look evil in the eyes of the Egyptians. And therefore, and then 
And then they, they cause this affliction. The Balagada is telling you that the first stage of Paro's affliction was a propaganda effort. The Balagada is telling us a profound insight on how our enemies operate. And by the way, throughout history, step one is always the propaganda. And therefore, that's really what they're telling That's what Hachamim are telling us. And by creating this comparative analysis of Sukib, we have this very profound influence. Again, it may escape us sometimes. But if we think about it, if we take back, it's an extremely interesting, engaging event, taking one pasuk and comparing to another pasuk and cross-interpreting. Very nice. Very nice. Um, you also touched on the aspect of engaging kids. Um, and I want to follow up with that and to speak, with, you know, I'll speak for myself and I think we can speak to many others, you know, my age, even older than me, uh, who are challenged this year with you know, something new, and that is we need to really engage our kids through this seder. Um, either kids or sometimes possibly even, you know, keeping the teens involved. I think it's two separate questions. Uh, if you could really maybe address both of them, how do we engage our kids? What are some good ideas of what to do with the kids and also how to keep the teens involved? So I'll answer with really um, what the Lila said this about. I remember um, before Pesach, he would always caution the parents that to remember that this Lila said that is not about them. Right? And you can imagine who more than would want to spend this Lila Seder in deep uh, and, uh, analysis of Torah. Right? Chavadiyah's level of learning unmatched. That's what, and yet he would say very often that he would spend the Seder, Lila Seder night engaging the most youngest children in stories. First step we need to know is that Lil said is not about us, right? It's not us being challenged on our level. It's about engaging the next generation, right? The, and through that, the Haggadah tells us that we have four children and that we engage each of those four children on a level for each one of them, right? You don't answer that, you don't engage the Hakam like you engage the Tam. And you don't engage them like you engage the Rashaw Shen or the other show. Each child needs to be engaged on his level. And that's why I said maybe in a small said that it could be a unique opportunity for us to actually begin engaging people and especially engaging our children each on that child's level. Now, sometimes you'll have, you know, uh, young parents who have extremely young children who the old, fooled with only elementary school age and maybe the oldest child could be not even bar mitzvah. In that situation, obviously, you need to be creative. You need to remember, now it's not the time, this said there's certainly not a time to talk about profound hidushin, right? But rather, there can be unique creative ways, games, costumes, although you can't buy costumes here, but creative ideas, fun approaches to actually turn the said into an engaging activity for the youngest child. If, however, you're dealing with teens around your said so it might be a time to actually engage in challenging intellectual discussions. If it's a less motivated group, then it might be to engage in a, um, the messages of Yitzhak Mitzrayim and how they'll apply to today. And I think, by the way, in today's situation, there's unique opportunities of what we're all going through today to see seeing God's hand as it was in Mitzrayim and trying to understand the message of God's hand in today's situation and what HaKadosh Baruch Hu is trying to tell us today in, its, in, in, in our unique potential deliverance today. So I think there are different unique ways and different challenging ways that we can engage the members of our studying, depending really on who they are and and what their and um, and also what their interests are. So you, you really need to know your audience. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, I guess also on 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 the Haggadah piece, 
Um, there are a few things that come up as maybe odd, a little weird. Um, I'll start with the poem of Dayenu. Um, everyone speaks about it. What's, what's the shot of really what's going on over here of how you're able to say Dayenu at, you know, such, you know, every step of the way, or is it just supposed to be looked at as maybe one whole poem and don't look into it too much? Right. So if you look at the Dayenu, if you look at the Dayenu, the Dayenu is, has in itself, some of it perplexes us because, right, forget, for example, if you took us out of Egypt, but you didn't cr open the sea, it would be enough. We, we, we'd probably be dead. Um, sorry. Um, we'd probably be dead. If you, um, if you split the sea, but didn't drown the Egyptians, well, what would be the point, right? You split the sea, they go, if, there's no point. So we're confused. So there's, an, there's in, many different interpretations, but I think the most unique one is that it, it God showing his hand, his miraculous hand of deliverance in different ways. In other words, every one of those things were miracles that God could have accomplished without performing the miracle. We were in the desert. Did we actually need man? We really could have engaged local countries and local populations. We didn't have to survive on divine food. Um, it is possible that the Egyptians would have seen the sea split and turn back. Did they have to go in and be drowned? There are many, many different aspects that our Mifarshim say could have been handled without the miraculous. But our existence in Mitzrayim, what we say, Dayenu, is one miracle after the other. And that becomes a unique experience, right? That there are points that we could have been saved without the miracle, but he did it. And he did it to show his love. He did it to show how much he cares of us and how dear we are to him and how therefore we would hope to, um, to eventually uh, show that dedication and devotion to HaKadosh Baruch. Okay, nice. I know you spoke about this once before. I heard you speak about um, this, this, really the episode with the, uh, the five hachamim, Rabbi the Ezer, Rabbi Oshua, Rabbi Azab and Azariah, Rabbi Tarfon, Rabbi Akiva, that they were sitting in Bnei Brak and on discussing uh, Lil HaSeder. Uh, but interestingly enough, um, I'd say the, the main rabbi, the chief rabbi of the time, Rabban Gamliel, is, is missing from that whole uh, episode. You know, what, what exactly is going on? What are they discussing? You know, a lot, of, a lot of people also speak about what are they discussing? traditional commentators, modern modern commentators, what exactly are discussing the whole night until, uh, you know, Kriyat Shema of the morning? So, um, uh, Rabbi Sachs has an interesting uh, uh, point on that by his Haggadah. It's very lengthy. It's about six or seven pages. Obviously, I'm not going to go through that at that point. But I'll just mention one thing. You know, if you look at the names of the Hachamim, Rabbi Azar, Rabbi Azariah, Rabbi Akiva, Rabbi Oshar, Rabbi Tarfun. If you take out Rabbi Tarfun, who is clearly the elder, you will find that these are the three hachamim that in their, each in their own way oppose the Rabban Gamliel. And many say that this, this is the time of the, where Rabbi Azar ben Azariah replaced the Rabban Gamliel. We do have an, a, a similar episode in, in the Tosifta, not mentioned in the Haggadah, where we have a ma'aseh where Rabban Gamliel was making his seder. And it's unique what they were discussing. Rabban Gamliel's seder was talking about the laws of Pesach. It is this seder with, with in Bnei Brak, which is the house of Rabbi Akiva, so he seems to have been the host, and Rabbi Azar ben Azariah, who is the, probably could be the Nasi at that point. You have Rabbi Yoshua, who is the greatest sage of his, of his time, right? And Rabbi Tarfon certainly by far the elder statesman. And they're all making this seder probably in the house of Rabbi Akiva. And we know that they had, disagree they had a specific disagreement about wh at what point the deliverance happened. Was it until Hatzot? Was it until the morning? And one can imagine, and, and, and the Gemara says that they're all on different sides of, this point, of, of the coin, right? And uh, two versus two, actually. And one can imagine 
if their seded was engaged in a halachic dispute at that point, it probably wouldn't have been resolved. And maybe that isn't what was the seder should be about. Rather, their seder involved an avoidance of those halachic disputes and actually a discussion of the, about the great miracles, a more agada version of the seder. And it's almost a mute point because they go all night until that argument becomes not relevant. And so that's how Rabbi Sachs looks at the, uh, at the Lila Seder. Mm-hmm. Okay, we'll open up the, you know, the floor to questions if anyone wants to ask. So before you do that, I want to address one or two halachot. Okay. Um, especially one or two that I was asked last time. Regarding, I was asked regarding Sefirah Ta'omer. So first I want to say, I was asked this question multiple amount of times. And I want to say, any, there have been many planned Simachot. Some have gone, you know, weddings, for example. Some have happened, right? Because, but with a very small, maybe 10, 12 people. And some weddings did not happen. And the question is, can the weddings, once hopefully we get out of this and we're able and we're allowed to have more festive occasions with larger groups, and if that time, if we get out of this and it's during Sefirat HaOmed, can we make weddings on the Omed? So I think if we look at the Halakha, I think it's clear. Not having weddings on the Omed is a minhag. We do not like pushing off weddings. And so therefore, anyone whose wedding did not happen at its time and needs to be pushed off may make that wedding at any point during Sefirat HaOmed. Ideally, Rosh Hodesh or whatever it is, but it doesn't have to be that way. And he may make the wedding on Sefirat HaOmed. I remember we asked that question, I pushed it off. In terms of, of haircuts and shaving, shaving in reality, there's whatever your custom in shaving is every year, you, you keep it this year because there's no difference because you could shave like you could shave any year. But regarding haircuts, um, there, anyone who could not get the haircut um, throughout this time can't see a barber and hopefully during the Omed will, things will open up he may get a, uh, a haircut um, on the Sefirat HaOmed. I would even say the Moed, but very frankly, um, somehow I'm not that optimistic that barbers will be, will, be, will be at the point where barbers will be open next week on Halam Moed. So, um, but certainly during Sefirat HaOmed, um, that, 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 that those customs of the Sefirat HaOmed in this year will certainly be pushed aside. That's uh, okay. one uh, Can I follow up what you mentioned uh, with the, um, the weddings? So you're allowing weddings on Sefirat HaOmer, on the, on the Omer, for something that was pushed off. Would you allow it during the three weeks at the opening of the summer as well? Would you categorize it the same? But, you mean if it goes all the way to the three weeks? Yeah. In other words, I, I see what you're saying. You're saying, assuming the p- more pessimistic version of this, that this actually, I'm trying to be optimistic. More realistic version. We're going to be out of here in a couple of weeks, but you're assuming this goes on until the, until the three weeks. I would, yes. Okay. I would probably say we should reserve the nine days not, but during the three weeks, we definitely would. Um, we, yeah, if we go and that many weddings are pushed off, we could definitely allow weddings uh, on the three weeks. Um, right. We should probably the show the, 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 the nine days, which is really take out Rosh Chodesh and Shabbat itself becomes one week. That time we'd probably refrain. Um, I, maybe not, but I'm pretty sure we, and, but, the, but the three weeks we don't know. And what is the law? I mean, now we're touching on weddings a little, but what is the law about pushing off a wedding? Is it something, it comes up in discussion a lot. You have a, a date. Um, a lot of people speak about not pushing it off once you have a date. Can you push it off a few weeks or a couple of months so you could have a full ceremony together if you want? Is it something customary? Is it something that's superstitious? Where, where is all this? The, 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 the way the Gemara brings off the discussion of pushing off a wedding, and sometimes it's necessary to push off a wedding, but may not have a look and things like that. It's really a financial discussion. In other words, the idea, I mean, no one wants to push off a wedding, right? You definitely don't want to push a wedding off. You're getting married and people want to enjoy their simha. Nobody wants to have to push a wedding off. But there are times where it becomes a necessary event. And the, the, the Gemara and Masek Tubot actually talks about it in terms of a financial situation. 
will pushing off the wedding cause un unnecessary financial burden on the people making the wedding? That becomes the ultimate. So therefore, if for example, a person just had a wedding date, didn't, di and, and changing that wedding date will cause no financial burden whatsoever, and it just happened you discuss it, you thought you'd book this date and you want to book a different date and you want to make it early, you want to make it later. There's no concern there. There's no concern about doing that. Really, we're talking about our situations here. We're talking about um, situations where it's financially difficult to push the weddings off. That has a serious um, uh, aspect of halakha. And very frankly, in this situation, I mean, especially if it would go in the scenario you painted, Jesse, that we're really going to, you know, it's going to take a long time till we go back. One could only imagine the abundance of weddings that will be happening some back to back. And I don't know if we'll have enough days in the summer to imagine that, to push that together, Baruch Hashem. So therefore, certain leniencies need to happen for those reasons. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, and does anyone else have questions before we uh, close it out? I don't see anyone raise their hand. Rabbi, you're so clear, no one has any questions. How about, how about your, gra your, your grandfather? Uh, grandfather, go. Uh, no, I just wanted to get, in, uh, sorry to get involved in this. Uh, last week was discussed uh, regarding putting a piece of aluminum face down uh, on the uh, barbecue and saying that it turned white. Uh, I just wanted to uh, let you state that the turning white is like Marjorie said, uh, not from the aluminum though, uh, I would say it's probably turning white from the, uh, the food that was on the grill. It, it became so charcoal um, that it, it, it turned to a powder. And, but I still wanted to say, I'm, you know, I'm not the rabbi, but of course I'm like, like rabbi, I have an answer. Um, I think it had gotten that hot that it caused the food that was on the grill to be burnt to a, a crisp. I mean, so it's, it, it was like, maybe you could say it was, it was, uh, it was, uh, uh, you know, like as as though laboon. Right. In other words, the the, the, the the food the food you could just brush off the food you just could brush off uh, as as a powder. That's how that's how burnt it got. Right. So I, I saw the, the video that you're talking about. Um, I didn't know and that it was a video. And it definitely Busy. looked. The, hello. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah, no, so I saw the video that you were talking that, that was shown. It, it definitely looked at, to me that we were getting close to the point of the boom, that the heat was so intense. Now, it's true that what was turning white, was it the metal or was food on the metal turning white? Um, I, I don't know if we have to be that um, uh, I don't know if we have to be that uh, and analytical. I mean, the item, the, the grates were literally turning white. And if, if, if that's the case, I think that we've, we've, we've achieved the necessary level of heat. Again, I'm saying the, the grades were not necessarily turning white as opposed to the food that was on the grades. They were uh, the ones uh, that were turning white. Yeah, I, I mean, understand. I'm still agreeing. I'm still thinking myself personally that, my goodness, that's, you know, it's, it's, it's abnormal hot. Because if you would normally, without using that aluminum, just close the, the grill, turn on the fire for an hour, it wouldn't cause those grill. By the way, I, I, want, I want to say something like this. Hacham Vijay talks about two, two ways to tell if it's libun. One, if it turns white, or one, if it turns red and sparks. I, I wonder if you would take metal that was never used with no food on it whatsoever, and you would heat it to the highest level of heat, it would probably turn red and spark, but would it ever turn white? I, I don't know. It may be that that's part of what Libun is about. I don't know. Okay. I, uh, I think it's okay. Okay, that's, that's the, 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 last, the last two words is fine. Yeah. I think it's okay. <laughs> uh, Danny Harari. I missed you. Hi, Rabbi. So here's my question. Usually we associate Pesach with an unusual <laughs> happiness, freedom, uh, liberation. Um, this 
unusual sense of, of pride and happiness and joy. And this year, obviously, there's, there's, you know, a dark shadow in the background that seems to be sucking out a lot of the simha um, for, for everyone, you know, for the people making it, making the starim who can't be with their, their parents, their extended family, and for the kids as well. So h- how do you deal with that going through the seder, whether it's you yourself as, as the one making the seder, knowing what's going on in the background, and also conveying that to your kids? I think the message really has to be that we, we as people, are, 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 don't have control over everything. I think what we're learning here is that we like to believe that we can control, that we have ultimate control. And I think what we've all realized, I think what the frustrating thing and the frightening thing, really, and it's, it's, it's terror, is that we're in a situation where literally, it's a situation of life and death, and we don't know what to do. Our society doesn't know what to do. Our leaders don't know what to do. Um, we're almost learning as we go. And we see a message, we've lost control. We've lost the ability to predict and control and direct the situation. We just don't have it. And I think part of the message is to, to think and to tell us, look, it's scary. We don't have control, but that's part of who we are. And that's part of what Yitzhak Mitzrayim was about, right? We're not in control. We have to realize that. That HaKadosh Baruch Hu in our history has given us different scenarios to deal with. And we are not in control. There is an interesting Ramban that I'm fond, fond of, that the life in Israel is uniquely special because it's all based on rainwater. But what does that teach us? That we drink when it rains because we're out of control. It is God who controls the scenario. But what can we do? What can we do is respond in kind. So if God in his infinite wisdom has decided that this is a Pesach that we're not all going to be together. So we make the best and we celebrate the Seder as we can. And we look at it and we take it into a positive and we connect to the situation that HaKadosh Baruch Hu has put us in, and we perform the mitzvot in the way that situation that Hashem put us in demands. And so we're going to have small study this year. Okay. We're going to look at, at that and see how that challenge, we're going to make it into something positive. That's, I think, a key message that we're learning this year. Right? We're going to, and that's, it's the same thing if I get back to that abridged Tagada, which I said, okay, it's not ideal, but even those who are literally going to be alone for the first time in their lives, they're going to celebrate a sin. We're going to be able to turn to HaKadosh Baruch Hu and we're going to say, God, we are yours. We are your people. And we observe your Torah no matter what, no matter how, and no matter what situation you put us in. And we're going to try and figure out how we can best deal with the situations that are presented to us. That's the only way and the only message I see that's even relevant to, to understanding our situation. I don't think we should be trying to seek reasons why God has decided that he's going to hit the world with this COVID-19 virus right now. I think we have to understand now that God has done that, how we respond best, how we take this message, how we improve our lives and how we perform the Torah and the mitzvot, regardless of whatever situation we're in. Okay, very nice. Uh, we're coming to the end. Uh, do you want to just leave us with a closing remark? Holiday wishes? Uh, okay, I want to look, last time I mentioned, and I think it's important, last time I mentioned the concept of pikuach nefesh, and that pikuach nefesh is something that in, even no matter what, in any doubt, we should be not even hesitant to 
transgressing Shabbat, transgressing Yom Tov, to save a life. I think that's important. And I think we need to do that. By the way, um, I wanted to send this message. I've gotten the questions. People with relatives in the hospital, um, if you have a relative in the hospital, and by the nature of the way this disease is, he'll be alone in the hospital. No relative will be there. It is important, Shabbat, Yom Tov, to have a phone available because we've gotten questions from people and I've told them that they should have a phone available and if there's any call, to answer it right away because there might be decision and life-sustaining decisions that need to be made and can only be made on the phone. In fact, I told that to somebody and it happens to be this past Shabbat. I told them to do that. They did that and there was a life-sustaining decision that needed to be made right away of a procedure that couldn't wait. Thankfully, he had the phone with him. So you need to not hesitate. You need, if someone's in the hospital, you need to have the phone with you so that you can literally answer it as you need and be able to deal with the situations that are presented to you. Uh, um, uh, uh, and I, I think it's very important. I think that's, that's a necessity that we sometimes won't think. Okay, he's there, he'll be fine. You may need to be involved. Please stay close to your phones and don't hesitate to answer the phones if there are, if, if, if the doctors or the hospital calls. It's, it, it sounds like an obvious point, but it is. Similarly, um, uh, we also need to understand that there are old people, elder people of our community that are alone. They may become depressed. Um, we need to understand that that depression, right, literally also potentially can have, um, can have serious consequences. So um, in a situation where there is an elder member of the community or of your families that are is alone, and for some reason you get a phone call from that person, first of all, God forbid, they could be getting sick. And second, we don't know their situation. For sure, in that situation, it's not a clear picture. If there's a non-Jew that needs to answer the phone, that's fine. If not, one should be cautious and careful. And if you need to answer the phone, you, you, you would answer the phone. So um, those situations present to us subtle situations, but we have to be very careful when it comes to that. Uh, we shouldn't take anything for granted this year. And Pikuach Nefesh has different ways to manifest it. And we should be, we, we should realize that Pikuach Nevish is pushing off all of these concerns. So please, um, I want to make that point. Uh, you know, I know I'm make, belaboring it maybe a little, but I'm doing that because it's really important. Um, we're, we're, we're living in unprecedented times. We're living in times where I've never dreamed of the type of questions I'd be getting. Um, and I really want to make, I want to accentuate the point that there is nothing, nothing that comes to, uh, beyond Pikuach Nefesh. Um, I also want to make mention, if God forbid someone has someone in the hospital, over three days, over three days, the way I understand it, with the glut in the hospital, if nobody calls a physician or somebody to check on that patient for three days, you do run the risk of that person being neglected and the correct care can make all the difference. So if it's not necessary based on your relationship with your, uh, the primary physician that's in charge, that's fine. Certainly if you have a goy that can make, some, that can make a phone call and that even you can request the doctor to just get updates. Um, but again, everyone knows their specific situation of their specific family member that might be in the hospital. But uh, these are things interacting with the physicians over a three day holiday is not going to be a maybe. It's going to be a fact. And you need to understand that and you need to not shy away from that point. Rabbi, how would you handle, sorry, I'm interrupting. How would you handle if the, answering the phone on Shabbat and your caller ID says spam? Uh, so that's a very good question. Honestly, sometimes spam happens when, if you have somebody in the hospital and you don't know who it is, 
right? And if there's a question that it could be the hospital, and for some reason your phone called it spam, answer the phone. If you have a non-Jew that can answer the phone, great. If you don't, just answer the phone. Agreed. Okay. Just uh, any other questions? About Biur Hametz. What? Biur Hametz. What's the exact uh, process this year? Uh, th there's okay. there's so, a question because they're saying that because the uh, the public workers are focused on other things that we should be more careful with how we do Biur Hametz. Yeah. So exactly. Let's say what not to do first. I don't want everyone going out in front of their house and making private bonfires and burning your hametz. Well, first of all, all together, um, creating potentially hazards where we really don't need them. So um, ideally, you should be saving much less hametz. I mean, those 10 pieces, if they can be crumbs or something, that would be ideal. And then the simplest way would be then to take that hametz in a bag, go into your house, and just flush it down the toilet. You have accomplished Biur Hametz, it's Zorek Layam. If, however, um, there's a little bit more than can, that could do. If you have a barbecue that you're not koshering, right? So um, you just burn it on the barbecue, that's okay. Um, make a little in your backyard, you could burn it quickly if there's not much. If, however, that's not an option, I already mentioned um, putting in the garbage can I understand that they're going to come pick it up on Tuesday. They're supposed to come before this man of the Isur. So that could be an option. In case they don't, in case they come late, what you could do is, what I would recommend is if there's more hametz than, that, that you can flush down the toilet, it can't be flushed down the toilet. And like I said, I'm not advocating break, making these big bonfires. What you could do is put the hametz in the garbage can. But before you put it in the garbage can, take a Clorox bleach, which probably we all have plenty right now, or uh, kerosene or anything like that, and pour it with the hametz to invalidate it from ra'uy la'chilat kelem, leave it in the garbage can, and then even if they pick it up after, it's not a problem, because it's mevo'ad, because it's not ra'uy la'chilat kelem, and that's fine. Those are the ways that I would recommend be or hametz. Actually, that, that, that led to another question that actually is completely separate. What about vitamins? Do vitamins need to be uh, kosher for Passover? Does that have to be a new jar? How, how, how does that work? So let me separate that question into two. Let's, let's talk about medicine, medicine. And sometimes vitamins are medicines, can be used as medicines, or medicines in general. And then I'll talk about vitamins that are just dietary supplements. Um, if it's a medicine, right, and it's a not flavored medicine, that does not need to be any marking, kashil pesa, right? It's, if it's a unflavored medicine that you're taking for health concerns, that's okay. If, however, it's a, if it's a, a, a flavored medicine, then you should try and find kashil pesa. But it doesn't have to be one that's marked because if you check um, many, you'll, you'll go to your local pharmacist, they'll be able to tell you if there's any potential questions of hametz, even in that flavored item, you should be able to, you know, there are many hashkahot that actually will offer that service, even if it's not marked. If it's just a, a dietary supplement, over there, we should, um, it should be, it should be hametz free. It should be hametz free. Because that doesn't have the same leeways as, as medicine. Okay. Anyone else? One, one quick point just about uh, Rabbi, the garbage. Rabbi, the medicine is flavored. Rabbi, the medicine itself is flavored. If the medicine is flavored, flavored, then it should not have hametz. Okay. If it's flavored, it should not have hametz. Just one point about the garbage cans. If you're absolving yourself from all hametz, isn't it irrelevant if the garbage truck comes before or after? In reality, you're right. In reality, you're right. Um, the reason I said to pour bleach or some Clorox is because since the garbage can might still be yours and it's still in your to shoot, even though you make it have kid, one, once you're throwing it away, there might, you know, 
to be extra cautious, you could pour that bleach or something in it. Um, but you're right, if it was hufkad, so it's like throwing it to the ruach, it's true. But being the fact that it's not being thrown in public domain, but it's still being in your personal um, uh, home or possession, it would be as a stringency um, uh, better to actually just pour some uh, pour some uh, substance on it, which would invalidate it, and therefore you wouldn't have to worry whether the guy comes before Pesach, after Pesach's money suit, no problem. Okay, thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks for your time. Okay. Wonderful, wonderful class, Rabbi. Appreciate Remember it. one thing. Excellent class. Just, I, I just will say, and just with this I'll end. Uh, it's difficult times, but Am Yisrael, if we learn anything on Pesach, has been through very difficult times in the past. And more than anything, Pesach has also about the survival of a Jewish nation that has survived against insurmountable odds throughout all our history. And just remember, we will get through this. We will get through it because we will get through it together. We will, um, Am Yisrael, even while they're separate, they're together. This class is an example. We have ways and we always find ways to interact. And that is an important idea. So just remember that as difficult as it is, we will all get through this. We will get through it. We'll be Baruch Hashem in a festive again. And it's important to keep that positive hope alive amongst all of us because it's just another challenge. We haven't come short of challenges over our history. It's just another one. We will get through this and we will become better, stronger, as that the ship.